Anyway. anyway, welcome everyone. This is the fourth in our series on um, Bentham and the Arts. Um, it's uh, wonderful to have um, Dr. Tim Mills from the University of Edinburgh um, here with us tonight. And um, Tim um, got his degree, first degree at St Andrews and then um, his DPhil at Oxford and then went on to a British Academy postdoctoral fellowship at, at Oxford. And um, he's written extensively and published extensively on the Romantics, people like Wordsworth and Coleridge and Shelley and Keats, but also on, on Bentham. And um, a, a combination which is usually seen to be diametrically opposed. Um, so we're very much looking forward to hearing what Tim has to say tonight. One of the themes in his work has been the relationship between truth and meaning in Romanticism, and hence um, his title tonight, Is it true? What is the meaning of it? Bentham, Romanticism, and the fictions of reason. So Tim, over to you, and we're looking forward to... Thanks very much, and um, thank you, um, to Philip and um, to uh, the Bentham Project for inviting me um, today. Um, so it's uh, I'm very pleased to be here, it's slightly daunted, uh, given that, um, as I think uh, Philip sort of hinted at in a way, Bentham is not my expertise area by any means. Uh, I am an English literature researcher. Um, my research is mainly in uh, the English Romantic Poets, um, but also the essayists as well of the period. So I've done work on um, William Hazlitt, who I'm going to talk a bit about today, uh, and uh, Charles Lamb, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, as well as uh, the poetry of Wordsworth um, and uh, uh, others. Um, Bentham, I came to in a strange kind of roundabout way about 10 years ago when I was working on my last book, um, in which I was trying to identify what I saw as a sort of proto-pragmatic strain within the, the thinking of the Romantic period, some sort of a, a kind of tradition that had gone unnoticed largely and, and hadn't had kind of been overlooked. Um, and Bentham was an important part of that uh, because the kind of line that I drew started with Hume, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Hume again today, David Hume, um, uh, through uh, radical thinkers like John Horne Took, Jeremy Bentham. Uh, and then what I tried to do is I tried to read these, uh, as I identified them, proto-pragmatic thinkers, through the, lens of, through the lens of modern pragmatist philosophy, so using thinkers like Donald Davidson, uh, Villard Quine, um, and uh, Hilary Putnam and Richard Rorty as well, to see if uh, that, that kind of perspective offered any, a, a slightly different way of reading the, the sort of philosophical assumptions behind a lot of romantic writing and a lot of romantic theory as well that hadn't been looked at from that particular perspective. So that's, that's, that's what I was doing. And, and it was that that really brought me to Bentham and primarily Quine's reading of Bren Bentham and what Quine had to say about Bentham in his book Ontological Relativity um, because he sees Bentham as as, as uh, 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 occupying an important place in, in the tradition of empiricism. He says that Bentham's, one of Bentham's um, innovations, his, uh, his idea of propositional meaning was, was identified by Quine as one of the five milestones of empiricism. I'm not going to talk about that, but uh, uh, that, that's really broadly the background of, uh, of my interest in Bentham. But what I want to do today is start with what Philip um, alluded to there, which is this traditional idea that utilitarianism and romanticism are utterly opposed categories. And I want to question that. I want to sort of look at that in a little bit more detail. So I want to start by looking at really the obvious starting point, which is John Stuart Mill's essay, um, his essay on Coleridge rather than Bentham. It was published in the London and Westminster Review in March 1840. And Mill has this to say. By Bentham, beyond all others, men have been led to ask themselves 
in regard to any agent or received opinion, is it true? And by Coleridge, what is the meaning of it? Bentham judged the proposition true or false as it accorded or not with the result of his own inquiries. With Coleridge, on the contrary, the very fact that any doctrine had been believed by thoughtful men and received by whole nations or generations of mankind was one of the phenomena to be accounted for. Now, the actual context of Mill's mar- remarks, as I'm sure you, you'll, you'll be aware uh, in the essay, is really the relationship between the church and social progress, or more broadly, between the demands of tradition and custom on one hand, and social justice and rational um, progress on the other. Mill thinks that England had reached an impasse, a point at which the middle ground between radical reform and conservative consolidation could no longer hold. By neither embracing new radical ideas, not quite managing to shut them out or hold them at arm's length, effectively by muddling along, um, as he continues, England had neither the benefits such as they were, of the new ideas, nor of the old. We were just sufficiently under the influences of each to render the other powerless. This was not a state of things which could recommend itself to any earnest mind. It was sure in no great length of time to call forth two sorts of men, the one pressing the new doctrines to their utmost consequences, the other reasserting the best meaning and purposes of the old. The first type attained its greatest height in Bentham, the last in Coleridge. So, as Mill sees it, Bentham collects the torch of radicalism from his 18th century Enlightenment precursors and shines it upon present-day institutions and the language that underpins them. The test he applies to such institutions is one of correspondence to fact. Does our current polity, he asks, have a basis in truth? Coleridge, in contrast, resists this impulse, as Mill sees it. As Mill depicts it, where the fundamental imperative in Bentham's thought is epistemological and empirical, be more specific. In Coleridge, it is hermeneutic and aesthetic. So instead of testing the empirical validity of the traditions, customs, and attachments of the people, Coleridge interprets them as expressions of the spirit of the age. For Coleridge, according to Mill, interpreting this expression, discovering its meaning, preceded the act of understanding itself. Now, Mill, of course, had little time for Coleridge's more fundamental claim, which was that the empirical understanding was inadequate in its attempt to grasp historical change. Unlike unlike Coleridge's followers, Carlyle, Emerson, and the American transcendentalists, most notably, Mill sided firmly with Locke and Bentham on the basic metaphysical questions. Quote, we see no ground for believing that anything can be the object of our knowledge except our experience, he insisted. We are therefore at issue with Coleridge on the central idea of his philosophy. Nonetheless, Mill's essay attempts to mediate between the polarized Benthamites and Coleridgeans by suggesting that despite its flawed metaphysics, Coleridge's conservative hermeneutic approach, what might be called a hermeneutic approach to history and politics, was not without its merits. And they had a lot to offer, despite his, his uh, flawed philosophical principles. Now, um, it's not, I'm not, what I'm not going to do today, it's not my aim here, uh, to assess the merits of Mill's arguments. I'm more interested in his premises than in his conclusions. 
Because in dividing contemporary thought into, on one hand, a reformist, fact-obsessed fact utilitarianism, and on the other, a conservative, aestheticized romanticism, Mill introduced a binary into modern intellectual history that has remained surprisingly durable. What, after all, could be more different, more opposed than Benthamite utility and romantic feeling? So, as I said, I want to complicate this picture. The picture of Bentham's relation to his romantic contemporaries. The great intellectual standoff that Mill describes between hard-nosed, forward-looking utilitarians and tender-hearted, homesick romantics must be seen within the contemporary debates over the relationship between the language of reform and the reform of language. Even here, Mill's distinction doesn't really work because romantic writers do not always line up in ways that one might expect. One of the best examples of this, for example, is the poet Percy Shelley. Now, Shelley certainly sides with Coleridge against Bentham by basing his defence, his famous defence in the defence of poetry, of the autonomy of poetry upon a transcendent language of imagination. Very much like Coleridge, straight out of the Coleridge playbook. However, unlike Coleridge, Shelley explicitly endorses Bentham in redirecting this imaginative energy towards the goal of radical political change. The essayist William Hazlitt, meanwhile, attacks both Bentham and Coleridge, the first for his misbegotten attempt, as Hazlitt saw it, to achieve a perfect transparency in language by purging it of feeling and metaphor, the second, Coleridge, for developing a poetics of metaphysical obscurity that was, and here Hazlitt would certainly have agreed with Mill, politically reactionary in its instincts. So I'm not just arguing that Mill's binary is too simple to adequately describe the complicated philosophical and political alignments of many of the writers that we think of as romantic. I also don't want to turn it into a straw man by assuming that Mill would have pressed this distinction very far. I don't think he would have. But what I'm interested in is the way in which questions of truth and meaning become entangled in a period in which the reform of language and the language of reform are such incandescent topics. To understand how this happens, we need to examine the way in which David Hume's scepticism lay the foundation for Bentham's theory of fictions by recasting the relationship between truth and meaning. My argument is that it's the influence of Hume's account of the fictions of reason upon Bentham that leads the latter to abandon the kind of positive empiricism that Mill defends and instead to prioritise matters of meaning over matters of fact. Conversely, the, what might be called the aestheticization of language in romantic writers signifies not the abandonment of an enlightenment model of truth, but its hypostatization and idealization. Okay, so I'm going to turn now to this question of uh, truth and meaning. Um, big question. But specifically in this context, in the early 19th century. The polarization that Mill perceives in contemporary thought between those who prioritize questions of truth and those who emphasize issues of meaning had its roots in Hume's conventionalist treatment of language. Now, although Hume did not produce a fully developed theory of language, unlike um, Adam Smith, for example, his interest in the way that customs shape human nature drew him towards an account of language as social and conventional. The groundwork for this conception is laid out in the treatise of human nature, and specifically in the treatise's theory of abstract ideas. 
Now, Hume famously argues in the treatise that all ideas are, fundam are ultimately derived from sense impressions. But despite this, he also concluded that the functioning of more complex and abstract notions could not be adequately explained by the input of sensory data. Instead, he argued, abstract ideas, general ideas, are themselves just particular ideas acting as placeholders for more general ideas. They are um, essentially particular ideas in disguise. The question then arises as to how these particular ideas come to masquerade as general ideas. Hume's answer is that they do so through linguistic conventions. As he puts it, a word raises up an individual idea along with a certain custom, and that custom produces any other individual one for which we may have occasion. Um, as Claudia Schmidt observes, for Hume, we not only acquire, quote, most of the words that we use to designate our abstract ideas by learning an existing language, but we also develop many abstract ideas by learning the general terms of a particular linguistic community. In this way, cognition itself is seen by Hume to depend upon conventions that are developed within a linguistic community. So against the Lockean idea that reference is achieved through the use of arbitrary signs, Hume argued that reference is always underdetermined by the referent. As Nicholas Philipson notes, for Hume, the story of making judgments was a story about human beings' encounters with common life, and that was fundamentally a matter of language. Hume's explanation of the emergence of general ideas through linguistic conventions encouraged other thinkers to reconsider the relationship between truth and meaning. In particular, his suggestion that abstract ideas are constructed through language drew some to consider the role of metaphor in thought Oops. and the extent to which reason itself was underpinned by social fictions embedded in discourse. This involved taking seriously the proposition, as Leslie Stevenson, looking back into the 18th century, uh, puts it, that, quote, if reason is fiction, then fiction is reason. And it's this idea, as Stevens expresses it, that Bentham's theory of fictions eventually internalizes. Um, and it's that that I want to turn to now. Bentham turned to address some of the problems of knowledge and language relatively late in his career, and it seems somewhat reluctantly. His impatience with metaphysical questions, however, was not simply a manifestation of the intolerance of the legal reformer for theory. Instead, it emerged from the conviction that any attempt to separate the theory and practice of human life was a mistake. Bentham weighed all philosophical problems against the question of utility. This, in turn, meant that the epistemologist mission to abolish error from the grounds of knowledge must ultimately be subordinated to eudaim eudaimonics, the study of the good life or human flourishing. Thus, as Bentham describes it in the appendix to his 1815 work, Crestomathia, Eudaimonics may be said to be the object of every branch of art and the subject of every branch of science. Although Bentham sounds confident enough here, by the time he came to write Crestomathia, it had already taken him three decades finally to overcome the philosophical problems that had ambushed him while preparing his first major work on jurisprudence, an introduction to the principles of morals and legislation, 
In the introduction's preface, he admits how surprised he was at the sudden intrusion of these difficulties. He writes, The body of the work had received its completion according to the then present extent of the author's views when he found himself unexpectedly entangled in an unsuspected corner of the metaphysical maze. A suspension, at first not apprehended to be more than a temporary one, necessarily ensued. Bentham realised that the introduction was not the best place to work through these problems. Indeed, it wasn't until the early 1810s that he finally got round to tackling the issues in which he'd become entangled. He did so in a series of essays, which included a fragment on ontology, the essay on logic, uh, the essay on language, and fragments on universal grammar. What was this problem? The source of the metaphysical maze that these belated exercises were intended to address emerges in the introduction's important chapter of motives. Here, Bentham's analysis of motivation quickly runs into difficulties because of his realisation that the word motive has two distinct meanings, one literal and figurative, the other, uh, sorry, one literal and legitimate, the other figurative and fictitious. As he puts it, the first denotes any of those really existing incidents from whence the act in question is supposed to take its rise. The second denotes a certain fictitious entity, a passion, an affectation of the mind, an ideal being. Logical fictions such as motive differ importantly from poetical fictions like centaurs or golden mountains and that they are indispensable to coherent thought. As Bentham later puts it in a fragment on, on, a fragment on ontology, quote, in the mind of all, fiction in the logical sense has been the coin of necessity, in that of poets of amusement, in that of the priest and the lawyer of mischievous immorality. Nonetheless, Bentham came to see that logical and legal fictions were linked to a web of figuration that stretched much deeper into human thought and language than he had anticipated. The language of reform and the reform of language could not, in the end, be separated. So, as he says, confining himself to the language most in use, a man can scarce avoid running in appearance into perpetual contradictions. To obviate this inconvenience completely, he has but, one, uh, he has but this one unpleasant remedy, to lay aside the old phraseology and invent a new one. So it seemed, after all, that utilitarianism could not simply model through without a thoroughly worked out ontology, an epistemology, and a theory of logic and language. The first two of these, epistemology and ontology, would jointly distinguish between real entities like physical bodies and individual perceptions on one hand, and fictitious entities such as, quote, faculties, powers of the mind, dispositions on the other. The task of the theory of logic and language was to give direction and assistance to human thought by translating the language of fictions as much as possible into that of real entities. For Bentham, this in turn meant converting overtly figurative language into a less figurative language based in sensations of pleasure and pain. Um, note, um, I say overtly figura figurative language into a less figurative language, and I'll come back to that later on. By doing this, Bentham reinforced his eudaimonics with the epistemological argument, as he puts it in a table of the Springs of Action, 1817, that, quote, pleasures and pains are the basis of all other entities. Crucially, 
The same utilitarian perspective leads Bentham to deny that any psychological entity is epistemically privileged. All human awareness, regardless of immediacy, is mediated via the receptacles, as he calls them, of pleasure and pain. This denial of the value-neutral status of sensation, of pure sensation, the idea that there is such a thing as pure sensation, this denial of that, is what underlies Bentham's pragmatic insistence in the essay on logic that, quote, in no place is anything to be known, but in the same place there is something to be done. It also forms the critical context for his attempt to invent a new phraseology, one based on the sound ontology of a hedonic register that would translate abstract statements into the lexicon of pleasure and pain. Since pleasure and pain are fundamentally the only index of the real for Bentham, this register would remain untroubled by the problem of whether the mind corresponded to the world. That was for epistemologists to worry about, not Bentham. At this point, however, another problem presented itself, that of the method of analysis by which such a translation could take place. In a footnote to an earlier work, A Fragment on Government, 1776, Bentham had discounted the traditional method of definition per genus et differentiam, pardon my Latin pronunciation, um, favoured by D'Alembert and the Encyclopedists. Fictional entities or abstractions, he claimed, cannot have examples or instances, and so cannot be defined in terms of a superior um, genus. Thus, when Bentham asks rhetorically, quote, what is a disposition? He imagines the reply. A disposition is a... And there we stop. The fact is, a disposition has no superior genus. A disposition is not anything. Conventional analysis will not work on fictions, according to Bentham, because the meaning of fictions is always overdetermined. As he puts it in the essay on logic, unlike physical syntheses or aggregates like, for example, a bushel of apples, logical aggregates are radically indeterminate and in that they are open to, quote, the unlimited powers of decomposition and recomposition possessed by the human mind. The conventional view of analysis and, th as, and synthesis as counterpart activities is a myth. One cannot simply unpack an abstract idea in the same way that one would unpack a suitcase, according to Bentham. Similarly, the Lockean method of explicating individual terms by tracing such units back to simple ideas or primitive perceptions rested on the assumption that there was some kind of field of neutral experiential data ideas and lock or impressions and Hume, to which Bentham simply did not subscribe. With its utilitarian and pragmatic view of the already evaluative status of sensation, Bentham's theory of fictions allows that language itself creates ideas, giving them a kind, what he calls a kind of, quote, verbal reality, so to speak, without which the matter of language could never have been formed. By accepting that figuration went all the way down to the referent, Bentham drew the sting from the, ch from the claim that reason and metaphor could not be separated. As um, Angela Esterhammer observes, in this way, quote, Bentham's theory embraces the principle that language does in fact succeed in creating immaterial objects and endowing them with at least a form of reality. Since meaning for Bentham is not psychological and causal, but holistic and relational, he can allow that it's perfectly possible for a word to be used correctly and successfully by a number of people who associate with it quite different ideas, or even no ideas at all. The meaning of a term, Bentham, is, not, uh, is determined not by causation, but by its context. 
For Bentham, two important consequences immediately follow from this position. The first is that the basic units of meaning are not single terms, but whole statements, speech acts, or propositions. John Horne Took had seen abbreviations and abstractions as a kind of degenerate language, but he'd failed to apply this observation to terms themselves. However, as Bentham argues in, the essay, in his essay on language, every man who speaks speaks in propositions, the rudest savage, not less than the most polished orator. Terms taken by themselves are the work of abstraction, the produce of a refined analysis. Ages after ages must have elapsed before any such analysis was ever made. Um, Secondly, in order to create this new phraseology, Bentham now developed a method of contextual definition, which he called periphrasis. Now, that's always uh, tripped me up, that word. I assume that's the way it's pronounced, periphrasis, and not um, any other way, but I'm willing to be corrected on that. For Bentham, this new method obviates the ontological embarrassment encountered by empiricists such as Locke and Tuke. The very point of periphrasis is that what counts as a real entity is ultimately a matter of coherence within a linguistic community, not one of correspondence between word and object. As W.E.V. Quine noted of Bentham, uh, as from his essay, Epistemology Naturalised, he rec- Bentham recognised that to explain a term, we do not need to specify an object for it to refer to. Paraphrasis thus enables one to explain talk of bodies in terms of talk of impressions by translating whole sentences about bodies into whole sentences about impressions without equating the bodies themselves to anything at all. More generally then, Bentham's theory of fictions signals a critical shift towards recasting the problem of truth as a subcategory of the question of meaning. Hume's conventionalist account of the primacy of the social function of language in the formation of general ideas had granted constitutive status to logical fictions or metaphors, in other words, to customary and habitual figures of speech that could not be distinguished in principle from the supposedly more literal words and statements through which common sense principles and the elements of reason are articulated. Even those who accepted Hume's conventionalist theories of language were troubled by this apparent outcome. Bentham's refusal to put epistemology before ethics, however, and his thoroughly utilitarian approach to the contextual definition of logical fictions enabled him to adopt a more pragmatic view of the uh, a pr- more pragmatic view of the constitutive role played by figurative language in human speech acts. Ultimately, he does so by subordinating the question "Is it true?" to the question "What does it mean?" So, um, so that's my line on Bentham. What then of Romanticism? Well, instead of discussing Coleridge, I want to focus instead upon one of Coleridge's rebellious disciples. Um, the Romantic essayist, William Hazlitt, was, of course, the tenant of Bentham at 19 York Street, Westminster, between 1813 and 1819. During this time, Hazlitt never once met his landlord, who lived next door, and for his part, Bentham seems to have been aware of the essayist only as a source of rent, for the non-payment of which Hazlitt was duly evicted in the winter of 1819. Hazlitt had his revenge, however, in his pen portrait of Bentham five years later. Hazlitt recalls Bentham's original plan to pull down number 19, which had once been the home of John Milton, to pull this down, to make, as Hazlitt 
uh, calls it a thoroughfare like a three-stalled stable for the idle rabble of Westminster. In Hazlitt's profile, later to be the leading essay in his collection of pen portraits, The Spirit of the Age, 1825, Bentham's indifference to what Hazlitt calls the cradle of paradise lost is presented as symptomatic of an age dominated by abstraction, which, by seeking to ground all human life in a factual notion of truth, blinded itself to the non-rational powers of the mind that resisted such grounding. Um, this is Bentham, uh, Hazlitt on Bentham. <clears throat> Bentham has reduced the theory and practice of human life to a caput mortuum of reason and dull, plodding, technical calculation. If the mind of man were competent to comprehend the whole of truth and good and act upon it at once and independently of all other considerations, Mr. Bentham's plan would be a feasible one and the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth would be the best possible ground to place morality upon. But it is not so. Hazlitt finds Bentham's work deeply ironic. He claims the great irony in Bentham's work is that its obsession, as he sees it, with acquiring clear-sighted and comprehensive knowledge of life is the very thing that restricts its vision. He sees Bentham as abstracted, as he puts it, like an anchoret in his cell. His eye, Bentham's eye, he says, glances not from object to object, but from thought to thought. Nowhere is this more evident than in his use of language, Hazlitt claims, which, in insisting on neutrality, betrays a kind of rationalistic bias, and by striving for transparency, achieves only opacity. He writes, <clears throat> this is the, still the, the essay on Bentham. Mr. Bentham's method of reasoning, though comprehensive and exact, is rather like an inventory than a valuation of different arguments. The construction of his sentences is a curious framework with pegs and hooks to hang his thoughts upon for his own use and guidance, but almost out of the reach of everybody else. It is a barbarous philosophical jargon with all the repetitions, parentheses, formalities, uncouth in the nomenclature and verbiage of law Latin. In short, Mr. Bentham writes as if he was allowed but a single sentence to express his whole view of a subject. Then. For Hazlitt, Bentham's thought and work reflected some of the great philosophical blights of the age. Empiricism in epistemology, materialism in ontology, and egoism and utilitarianism in moral theory. That the last of these stemmed from the first two, which he saw as mutually sustaining, he spells out clearly in his 1809 work, Prospectus of a History of English Philosophy. According to the ruling philosophy in Britain, Hazlitt complains, quote, the mind itself is nothing and external impressions everything. All thought is to be resolved into sensation, all morality into the love of pleasure, and all action into mechanical impulse. In opposition to this tradition, Hazlitt made it a cornerstone of his philosophy that, quote, the mind has laws, powers, and principles of its own, and is not the mere puppet of matter. So the error of people of sense, and in this category, Hazlitt includes people like Bentham and the poet Shelley, the error of such people of sense is that by mistaking the abstract rational forms that, quant uh, that quantify experience for the pith and narrow of the thing itself, they come to know only what Hazlitt calls the form and not the power of truth. Against this perspective, Hazlitt pits his moral idealism, his belief that the mind itself forms experience, and hence its own moral objectives, whether these are self-interested or disinterested. For, for example, 
In his uh, essay that was published uh, as part of the collection called The Plain Speaker, um, the essay on reason and imagination, Hazlitt defends what he calls natural feeling against Benthamite considerations of the, quote, pros and cons of utility and inutility. He introduces a range of ideas and concepts, including sympathy, moral sense, and instinctive perception, all of which he deploys to mediate between what he sees as the estranged realms of bloodless calculation on one hand and passionate feeling on the other. Expressing a hatred for, quote, people who have no notion of anything but generalities, Hazlitt argues that, quote, logic should enrich and invigorate its decisions by the use of imagination. So far, so romantic. And yet, Hazlitt also attacked the tendency to romanticize nature and humanity. He worries that the romantic aestheticization of knowledge might produce an intellectual culture in which the boundary between reason and imagination, fact and fiction, blur into a kind of indifference. Indeed, it's this very elision of poetic imagination and prosaic fact that he decries in Coleridge, who has, quote, by an ambition to be everything, become nothing. His metaphysics have been a dead weight on the wings of his imagination, while his imagination has run away with his reason and common sense. So Hazlitt muses, although reason and, uh, reason and imagination are both excellent things, perhaps their provinces ought to be kept more distinct than they have lately been. Hazlitt is determined not to collapse the boundary between imagination and reason, fiction and truth. And this determination highlights the connection between Hazlitt's epistemology and his aesthetic theories, particularly his aesthetics of the sublime. So a good example of this is the essay, his essay, Why Distant Objects Please. In this essay, um, he uses the gap between the two drives of human nature um, and invokes this in order to explain the enchanting effects of spatial and temporal distance. So, as, uh, as Hazlitt notes, it is not the little, glimmering, almost annihilated speck in the distance that rivets our attention and hangs upon the beatings of our hearts. It is the interval that separates us from it and of which it is, it is the trembling boundary. Into that great gap in our being come thronging soft desires and infinite regrets. Now, that phrase, trembling boundary, I think is, is a very um, suggestive one, um, uh, generally in, in Hazlitt. It's, the, it's this aesthetics of the trembling boundary that are, I would argue, integral to Hazlitt's metaphysics. And it's... Oh, they're also a characteristically romantic response, I would argue, to the epistemological challenge of Hume. As Uttara Natarajan has observed of Hazlitt, following Hume, Hazlitt recognises the sensory constraint upon imaginative capacity. But his theory, unlike Hume's, allows for such constraints to be altogether surpassed by the cultivation of the imagination. Hazlitt's trembling boundary reflects the complexity of his response to a growing awareness after Hume of the constitutive role played by epistemological fictions in thought. Bentham's theory of logical fictions took its cue from Hume by reducing epistemological problems to hedonic considerations of human well-being and flourishing. On this analysis, those fictions that are least likely to promote happiness are those that we are under the strongest moral obligation to discard. And yet, while Bentham's management of fictions was progressive in the way that it anticipated the removal of residual fictions from social life through the systematic proliferation of information, 
Hazlitt's essays explore the liminal ground between truth and fiction, evoking the shadows of lost certainties for aesthetic effect. Now, in their different ways, both thinkers acknowledge that there is no way of answering Hume's scepticism on its own terms. This is, in a way, what unites both. But Bentham's strategy is, I would suggest, inherently proto-pragmatic, making the goal of verification secondary to that of clarification by paraphrasis. Paraphrasis. Hazlitt's response, in contrast, is to idealise truth by subliming it into an indeterminate ground between reason and imaginative fiction. Very much like the transcendental metaphysics of his mentor Coleridge, Hazlitt's philosophy insists upon the overriding importance of truth by memorialising its absence. Uh, uh, how am I doing for time? I'm... Okay. Uh, so, to conclude then. Uh, is it true? What is the meaning of it? What are the broader ramifications of this perspective? Now, I hope that I've suggested some ways in which the relationship between early 19th century utilitarianism and romanticism might be rethought. Mill's truth-meaning binary no longer works when one starts to read Bentham as a proto-pragmatist and the romantics as thwarted objectivists. As far as Bentham is concerned, my own feeling is that the biggest mistake that is often made is to assume that he is an empiricist and the Lockean mould, as a philosopher of fact. But what Quine, among others, has demonstrated, I think, is that Bentham always saw the question, is it true, as subordinate to the question, what does it mean? That is, how does it translate and paraphrase? For Bentham, the literal and the figurative, the factual and the fictional, shade into each other. As he writes... In the essay on language, the discourse that is not figurative is the discourse in which no other fictions, no other figures are employed than are absolutely necessary. The final words of this statement are crucial. They show that Bentham saw his task as ameliorating the effects of logical fictions in discourse, not that of removing them. Indeed, as Esterhammer observes, Bentham's acknowledgement of the priority of the figurative over the psychological means that he fully embraced the performativity of language with all its contingencies and breakdowns precisely because he saw fictions as fundamentally inescapable. Conversely, for Hazlitt and Coleridge, the fictions of reason are hypostatized as a kind of ineffable territory that only art and feeling can access. In Hazlitt, the sublime power of truth, as he calls it, comes to reside at the trembling boundary between reason and imagination. In some, then, I think Mill got it about half right. Bentham's vision of truth is certainly progressive and reforming, while the Corrigian romantic view, if you want to call it that, is fundamentally nostalgic, and you could argue conservative. But of the two, I think, it's the romantic writer who's fundamentally interested in the question and asking the question, is it true? And I think it's Bentham who fundamentally asks, what is the meaning of it? Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Tim.